So welcome to my talk titled Morpher, a single language for business and technology. And before I jump into the presentation itself, let me say a few words about myself. Um, so I, I spent almost two decades in, in software development. Most of that I spent uh, working at Morgan Stanley, 14 years. Um, for most of that, I've been building trading systems. Um, and most recently, um, I moved on to uh, the financial and regulatory reporting areas. Um, but while that was my day job, I, uh, uh, throughout this whole period, I was really searching for the ultimate modeling language, a, a language that allows me to express business problems in a, in a very efficient way um, so that uh, it can be solved using uh, automation. Um, and along the, the, uh, the way, I tried many languages. So I, I started as a Java developer, and then moved on to Scala, and then uh, nowadays I'm doing a lot of Elm coding. Um, if you don't know Elm, it's a functional programming language, so you, know, you can see the progression as I move from object-oriented towards more and more functional um, through Scala, which is, supports both. Um, so as I was doing that, I, I tried many others. Uh, but these were the main ones. Uh, I got into programming language design, and you'll see how that's relevant to uh, the presentation as well. Um, and finally, I, I'm a co-creator of Morpher. Um, I'm responsible for most of the core coding. Um, so uh, let me let me exp like jump into what Morpher is, or give you an overview of more what Morpher is. Um, so it's it's developed and open source by Morgan Stanley, and then uh, it was contributed to Finos last year. Um, so the core of it is, uh, is a business-focused um, intermediary representation, and that's where it uh, goes back to um, programming languages, programming language design. Uh, an intermediary representation is, uh, is something that um, all the programming languages have, all the compilers have internally uh, to basically capture um, the logic in a, in a platform independent way. Uh, so what, what we did with Morpher is basically uh, created a simplified version of that that is, um, uh, that is easier to process using tooling and, and exposed it. Uh, compilers usually don't expose that uh, intermediary representation. They treat it as an internal detail. Um, but uh, as you will see, we found that um, it's, it's very useful to expose it as a, as a standard data format. Um, so the Morpher IR is, a, is basically a data format um, that, that is publicized. Um, and then on, on top of that data format, that, that is the core, but on the top of that data format, um, we, we have uh, various tools. Um, the, on one side, we have different ways of creating the business logic. So while a normal programming language would have uh, one syntax, and you have to learn that syntax, and then uh, that's how you can code in that language, uh, Morpher has many syntaxes, if you like, uh, many ways of creating the business logic. So our main one is Elm, a, a purely functional programming language. Uh, we have another one um, in the works, um, which is a, a Microsoft research language called Bosky. Um, we have a lot of other um, domain-specific languages within Morgan Stanley that, uh, that we translate from. And we also are experimenting with uh, GUI tools um, to, to build uh, the business logic. This is for like, business users, less, less technical users. Um, and then once you have that business logic captured in that Morpher IR, then you can do various things with it. Um, that's where it becomes uh, more interesting. Uh, so you can turn it into back into um, programming languages like Scala or TypeScript um, for, for execution, uh, but that's the least interesting part of it. The more interesting is that you can build visualizations um, that uh, explain um, the business logic to non-technical users, uh, and I'll get into uh, how, why that's interesting. So... Um, Throughout my career, um, I, um, I faced this challenge of building financial software. Uh, you basically have uh, two groups of experts. You have the, the business and the technology experts. 
Uh, both of them are really good at their area. They are, uh, they know everything about it. They know their domain really well. Uh, but they are together trying to build one thing, financial software. Um, and the problem is that they are not uh, speaking the same language. Right? They are, again, experts in their area. They know everything about that, uh, but they don't know much about each other's uh, domain. Um, and so because of that, what, what happens is that instead of having a, a proper dialogue, um, the whole conversation turns into a series of monologues. So basically, um, a business user will explain um, the, the business problem to solve in a long conversation or like a, a, a long monologue. And then uh, somebody knows that down, turns it into a specification, and that could be a BA or someone, uh, a, even a developer, um, and turns it into a specification, which is another monologue. Um, and then uh, the developers go in and look at that specification and turn it into the longest monologue, which is the implementation. And, and none of those uh, really are related to, too much to each other. They, 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 uh, they are pretty different. They all go through a, a phase of translation from one to the other. So um, can, can we turn that into a dialogue is the question and make it more efficient. So in to basically the goal is to speak the same language. How can we get these different groups to speak the la same language? So there's been previous attempts like UML is one of the big ones um, where you create a language and, and then get everyone to learn it. Um, I mean, that's obviously difficult, getting, getting different domain experts to learn the same thing. It, uh, one thing is that it's difficult, but because of the learning curve, the other thing is that um, usually these languages are not, not good at expressing uh, business problems. Like they are basically uh, um, a subset of all the, all the different domains. Um, uh, and the, the other big thing with, with specifically UML, but it's true for most of, most of these attempts is that uh, when, when they talk about language, they, they talk about um, a domain model. So that captures um, the, basically the data structures. They don't talk about the business logic at all. Um, if, I mean, UML has some attempts at that, but doesn't really have a good way to, to capture the business logic itself. Um, now, the Morpher approach is, is different. So we, we have one language, but that one language um, morphs into something that's already familiar for, for the given uh, domain expert. Um, so for the business, it turns into the diagrams that they can understand, that they can relate to, uh, such as like decision trees and decision tables. Um, and for the technologies, it, it turns into code that they can actually integrate into their system and, and they are intimately familiar with. And all this translation happens automatically. There's no uh, manual interaction involved. So that makes the whole thing uh, just magically work, basically, because the business user looks at the, the diagrams that they, are, they can understand and it does the exact same, it's guaranteed to do the exact same thing as the code uh, that the technologist is looking at. So, um, so actually let, let me jump into some demonstration of that. So um, the, the uh, example that I will use won't be very sophisticated, it won't be finance related. Um, uh, it's surfboard rentals, let's imagine that we have a, a business um, of renting out surfboards and we are talking to our business user and the business user uh, gives us a, a simple uh, explanation of the business model. We basically want to make a decision about um, whether to, uh, when, a, when a customer comes, in, comes with a request uh, to rent uh, a number of surfboards, we just want to decide if we can rent it out or we, we just have to reject the request. So um, as you can imagine, um, uh, we get on a call, um, the, uh, the developer goes in and uses Elm, as I said, uh, that's the modeling language we use, and basically builds the, uh, the, the business logic. Um, and, and so on what you see on the, on the left side um, is the visualization of that. So this is fully automated. So if I make changes to, to the logic, it immediately updates, as you can see. Um, so it's, a, it's an interactive uh, dependency between the two. So you, you can get on a call and do this together. Um, 
Now the next thing you might want to do is, is actually go in and interact with that business logic. That's usually one thing that you cannot immediately do. Maybe on a, uh, on a meeting you can draw up a decision tree uh, instead of writing code, uh, but you cannot interact with it, uh, which, which is something that you probably need in order to figure out if it works as expected. So let's say we have 10 server boards available and we want to get uh, we, we want to simulate if uh, we, the client asks for five of those. And what you can see is that we get uh, the results highlighted. The, uh, in this case, we would be um, basically allowing uh, the, uh, the rental. What if we request more than, than what we have? Uh, obviously, we, we reject that, you know, saying we don't have enough capacity. Now, a business user at this point might say, this doesn't look right because, I mean, we had 10 server boards available and they just asked for 11, so we had one less and we rejected the whole thing, so we are not renting out 10 server boards that we, we could rent out. Uh, so at that point, uh, they might go back and basically say, okay, let's look at this business logic and add a, add a flag to, um, to uh, make it possible to do um, partial rentals. So I cheated a bit and I added this allowed partial flag here just to make it easier to add it to the business logic. But I, I could be on the meeting doing this and basically say, hello, uh, partial. So in the, in the case where we normally reject, we make it uh, optional. So we, uh, we make it de depend on a piece of, uh, another flag so if we if we would normally reject it uh, then we will before we do that we will uh, look at uh, this flag and basically um, either allow the rental or not um, and and so again um, the uh, what, what you see is like you, you can immediately start to test that of course uh, you can you can capture that in uh, uh, in hard-coded test cases as well. So if I click on these scenarios, uh, I, I, I have the option to uh, build out test scenarios, uh, which basically uses the same, same kind of tooling, but as you can imagine, I, I won't go through it, but as you can imagine, it, it makes it very simple to, um, to add, um, add test cases uh, with all that help that you get. One thing that you might immediately notice is that it recognizes the fact that you have flags here with yes and no values. It does things like even uh, checking uh, for the validity of the values that you put in. All of this comes out of the box. So all, all you have to do is, is implement the, the ELM model, the ELM business logic for that. And the, the rest of it is inferred through the tooling, through going through the Morpher IR. Um, and of course, this is still a pretty simple business logic but you can imagine that it gets a bit more complex and we start taking into account um, the weather as well and because we might be closed when the weather is bad. Um, so you can, you can see an example of that here where we made, made the logic a bit more uh, complex and then it allows you to drill into it a bit. So if I click on is closed, uh, then, then it opens up the, an explanation on how that logic works um, and then I can immediately experiment with it again. Um, so let's see, let's select a few few things. You can see that it highlights the, the decision that it made and then it immediately started to highlight the, uh, the decision tree as well. Of course here, I didn't specify all the, the data that it needs, but if I do, then uh, it immediately reacts. And as you can see, so this, this makes it very interactive and very easy to work with the business to figure out the right business logic. And going back to the presentation. So what happened is we basically shortened the feedback loop of extremely because normally uh, to get that kind of feedback on the business logic, it takes at least weeks um, because uh, I mean, you, you need to put that business logic into an actual system, deploy it, and then the, the business users can uh, interact with it and realize that uh, you need changes to the business logic. So that got decreased from weeks to minutes. So that's a, a significant 
advantage. Um, and then it doesn't stop there. Um, the other thing that you get, which uh, I didn't demonstrate, um, is uh, you get automated, automated implementation. So basically we use code generators to turn the Morpher IR into various different languages. I have a Scala and a JavaScript example here. Um, so the nice thing about code, code generators is that um, they automate a very error-prone manual process, and they are very reliable, testable, and, and scalable. So what do I mean by reliable? They, they uh, don't make one-off mistakes like, uh, like developers do. Uh, they will make mistakes, of course, like uh, they can have bugs like any code, but they will make, make, it, make the same mistake all the time, so it's very easy to detect and very easy to fix, and once you fix it, it's done. Um, and, and that uh, goes back to t testability. And scalable, of course, uh, these code generators can produce hundreds of thousands of lines in, in seconds, while human develop developers can do that. Um, but what's more interesting is that it, it, it elevates you to a different abstraction level. So you can keep the, without changing the business logic, without ever touching the business logic, you can try out different technology stacks. So uh, usually when, when a new technology comes in or like the entire technology stack uh, is changing, uh, that happens in a couple of years in, in our industry. Uh, we usually have this huge risk of moving the business logic from one technology to the other. Now, if uh, it's in the more for IR, you don't have to do that. You, you can use the code generators to translate into the, whatever that new technology is. And, and the other thing is that you can uh, accumulate your technical expertise um, in the code generators themselves. So like, uh, as a junior developer turns into senior, uh, they accumulate a lot of knowledge, and then when they leave, they take all that knowledge. Um, with code generators, that doesn't happen. You, you, uh, it stays there and it accumulates over time. So, yeah, we're good. So with that, that's, that's basically all I wanted to say. Um, the, well, the most important thing is uh, you can get involved. Morpher is open source. Um, go, the core technology is really stable. Um, the, the IR itself and the tooling around it uh, but there are a lot of interesting tasks. It's an uh, integration technology, so there's, there's always a, there's a lot of potential for, uh, for building more visualizations, to build more code generators. Uh, we have a few of those in the works already. Um, and verification tools as well. So uh, we are working on some of those already with, with Microsoft as well, which you will uh, hear about in the, in the New York version of this conference. Um, so, I would just like to um, invite you to get involved in the in the project. It's uh, we have discussions. Uh, GitHub discussions is the best way to reach out to us. Um, and we already have a few discussions started in, in there. Um, so just jump on there and and start a discussion. Uh, and with that, I open it up for questions. Um, right now it has to go from the coding side, but uh, we already started to work on um, an editor, that um, a decision tree editor, which basically allows you to do edit the decision tree itself and, and turns it into more for IR. Uh, it's really a, a, a matter of like, and adding these tools over time. Uh, but the eventual goal is for non-technical users to be able to, to edit the business logic as well. Uh, but it all has to tie back to the SVLC eventually, right? So, but more, the more for IR gives you that data structure that you can manipulate behind the scenes and gives you that abstraction layer that makes it possible. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, that tool, that testing tool, is is pretty recent, but I mean, uh, a few months old. But, uh, but yes, we are definitely using it um, as a kind of a BDD uh, test. I wouldn't call it BDD because it's functional programming, so there's like no, like no timing aspect of things. So it's more about uh, inputs and expected outputs, uh, but it's uh, like very similar to that framework. Yeah.
Um, so the biggest one, um, biggest one that we did, um, it's hard to, m to measure the size really. Um, there's two big ones that we did uh, in the in, in terms of training systems. One, well, the first one that we did with the, the predecessor of this technology, which was not open source, uh, was uh, pricing calculation for securities lending, which is, uh, I mean, it's pretty big. I mean, it's a, it's, um, yeah, I, I, I don't even know how to estimate the, the size of it. Lines of code doesn't really matter in this aspect, but uh, I would say in, in terms of like individual uh, criteria classification rules it's in the hundreds um, and we also built a trading system which makes trading decisions and manages the life, cy life cycle of the trades within uh, the securities lending area as well so yeah pretty big yep and the taxes they could yeah they could uh, we we actually thought about that. Um, I mean, that would probably be. I mean, the only use of that would be to test the code generators, really. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, if you if you're testing the model and hopefully the code generator generates uh, equivalent code. Uh, yeah. I mean, so you can definitely do it. Uh, we, we have thought about doing that, yeah. Yep. So, probably one of the last questions, and then you can fire on the second one. What kind of test cases do you think you can use? Yeah, so these, all these test cases turn into JSON, right? So with the, with the input and the ex expected output. So yeah, it could turn into a PR that, that the JSON changes, basically. New test case or you change the existing test case. Yeah, so it's just data. All right, thank you. <laughs>